please, family, join with us as we bow for a word of prayer. Father God, creator of heaven and earth, Lord, you give us life. Lord, you are the author of the beginning and the end. Lord, everything we see comes from you, God, and we thank you. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you continue to bless this house, God. Be with your people today, God, in these trying times, Lord. Even now, God, as we are enclosed in our, in our personal houses, Lord, Lord, I ask that you put your, into your spirit into those houses, Lord. Allow your spirit to manifest and do something where only you can do, God. Lord, there are minds, there are hearts that need you right now, Lord. Lord, we know, God, that people are suffering right now, God, from mental illness, God, from being alone, Lord, from, from not being around loved ones, God. But Lord, we know, God, we are never alone in this world, Lord, because you are right there in the midst, God, where two or three are gathered together in your name, God. There you are in the midst. And we hold on to your word, Lord, because we know, God, that with your word, Lord, we will never be alone. There will never be a situation that we cannot overcome, God, because the victory is already won, Lord, in the precious name of Jesus, Lord, that we call on whose blood was shed, not just for me, but for the entire world, Lord. So, God, we're going to continue to offer praises during these trying times. We're going to continue to rely on your word during these trying times. We're going to continue to lie to rely on your strength during these try trying times in the hospital. God, we pray that your spirit enters the hospital, Lord. In the courtroom, Lord, we pray that your spirit enter the courtroom, Lord. Lord, anywhere that your saints may be, God, we pray, Lord, and we know, God, that you are right there with us, Lord. Our hands are going to continue to be in the master's hand, Lord. We're going to continue to put our faith in you, Lord. We're going to continue to put our trust in you, God. Lord, allow our hearts and minds to be one, God, because, Lord, where, 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 your, where Jesus is, Lord, in the church, Lord, they there you are, God, and we just thank you, Lord, for all that you do and all that you are able to do, God. And we're going to continue to call on you, Lord, in these times, God. Lord, we pray for the children, Lord. We pray for the parents, God. Continue to strengthen them, Lord, even now, Lord, as they're home dealing with things they have never dealt with before, Lord. Even now, Lord, as the children are doing virtual school, Lord. Continue to strengthen them, Lord. Encourage them, God. Even though it might be something they're not used to, Lord, just know, Lord, this is nothing that you have not seen before, God. For you are the Alpha and Omega, Lord. From the beginning of time, God, there you were. Until the end of time, God, where there will be a new beginning, Lord, there you will be. And we just thank you in advance for all that you do, God. And I pray this precious prayer in Jesus' precious name. Amen, amen. And I will be bringing scripture to you this morning. I'll be reading from the book of Psalm, chapter 119, verses 65 through 72. Please follow along with us and whatever version you have. And I'll be reading from the King James Version. The word reads, Thou hast dealt well with thy servant, O Lord, according unto thy word. Teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I have believed thy commandments. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now have I kept thy word. Thou art God, thou art good, and doest good. Teach me thy statutes. The proud have forged a lie against me, but I will keep thy precepts with my whole heart. Their heart is as fat as grease, but I delight in thy law. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. The law of thy mouth is better unto me than thousands of gold and silver. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and the hearing of his word. Amen. Good morning, Pleasant Hope. My name is London Connolly, and on behalf of our pastor, Reverend Dr. Heber Brown III, and our entire church family, I'd like to welcome all who are worshiping online with us today. Even though I cannot see you, know that we are together in spirit, and I pray you are transformed and strengthened by your experience with us. This week, I was having trouble writing the welcome. My dad offered to help me, and his solution was to pray. I'm not someone who normally prays, except in church, and I didn't know what to say to God. My mind was blank, and there was a pit in my stomach. My dad told me, prayer is a conversation with God. You speak to God, and God will put the words on your heart that will lead you to an answer. So we prayed for 15 minutes. I realized every week I've been trying to say something that I think will make your life easier, like a motivational thought for the day. But the problem was I did not feel motivated. 
I felt empty. How could I give hope when I couldn't find some for myself? What I did have was love. I had love for my family, for my friends, for the church. So instead of trying to say something inspirational, I would just like to say how much I love Pleasant Hope. How much I love you. Thank you for giving me a space to find my voice, to find a community. I appreciate it more than I can put into words. May God bless you. Have a beautiful day. God bless you, beloved, and thank you so much for joining us on this, the Lord's Day. We appreciate the time that we have together to share in moments of inspiration and information that I pray is soul food for you in your journey. I'd like to invite you to join me in the very last book of the Bible. It's called Revelation. Revelation chapter 21. And I'll be reading the first seven verses of Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 7. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version of the text. Please feel free to follow along in whatever version you have. Revelation 21, verses 1 through 7. While you're turning, will you share this video with your friends and those in your circle? Please inbox, text, post, retweet, share it. You never know. Somebody that you know and love might need some encouragement this morning as well. And you can be a bridge to exactly what they stand in the need of. Revelation chapter 21 verses 1 through 7 from the New Revised Standard Version of the text. Here's what it says. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. God will dwell with them as their God. They will be God's peoples, and God, God's self, will be with them. God will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. For the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. And that one said, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then the one said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. Those who conquer will inherit these things, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. That's Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 7. And family, for the few moments in the mind, allow me to preach as you pray in the Lord in power from the theme, the story is not over. The story is not over. Siblings, sisters, and brothers, friends, if you grew up in the kind of Sunday school I grew up in, then you were introduced to the Bible beginning with the very first book, Genesis. And etched across my mind, as may be the case for many of you, is the teaching and the introduction, rather, of that book of Genesis. The first few words of the book. In the beginning, dot, dot, dot. Whether you go to church every Sunday or whether you grew up 
going every now and then, or even just paying attention to pop culture, the first few words of the Bible are very familiar to many. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You can imagine my surprise then after years and years and years of hearing that phrase as the opening phrase of the Bible. Imagine my surprise when I was invited to sit under the scholarship of a dynamic and brilliant scholar, Dr. Will Gaffney, who stretched me and many others to look at a different interpretation of the same words in the original language. The English translation that we're most familiar with says, in the beginning, God created. The the there, <laughs> that definite article, puts the creation story within a specific and particular frame of time. It also lifts up the creation story as a seminal, singular event in the beginning. It was Dr. Will Gaffney and then after her, others who stretched me in my thinking based on the interpretation of the passage. It said, listen, when you look at the words in the original language, one way to translate it is in the beginning. Another way to translate the original language there is in beginning or in a beginning. An indefinite article of a beginning compared to the beginning leaves the door open to the possibility that what we read in the book of Genesis is but one beginning of many beginnings that the Creator invites us to consider. What if there, there's more than one beginning? What, what if the crack in the door is opened wide enough for us to consider that the beginning that we read about in Genesis is but one beginning? But our almighty, all-powerful, all-knowing God has other beginnings. My goodness. Man, if you would have told me that in Sunday school, <laughs> I would have fell out of my chair to consider that, yes, what I read in Genesis is one expression of the divine's creative power. But there are other beginnings that perhaps were not recorded on parchment, but are just as special and powerful. You know, it's that kind of thinking that invites me to consider the last book of the Bible as well. Because if there was any book in the mainstream Christian Bible that we automatically identify with the end of things, it's the book of Revelation. It is from that genre of ancient Jewish and Christian writings called the apocalypse from the Greek word disclosure or unveiling. Revelation as a word itself means clarity. This is the book intended to make clear the consummation of God's plan of judgment and salvation. However, despite its stated intent to bring clarity, the book of Revelation is probably the most unclear book in the whole Bible. <laughs> the pursuit of clarity is crippled by the book's complex layers and cryptic messaging, obscure authorship, and multiple perspectives. For thousands of years, people have wondered about the book of Revelation and its author who identifies himself as John. Even today, there are a great variety of views as to the message of Revelation. Some engage Revelation as a literal telling of how things will end. Joining the camp of premillennialists pre made most popular by the Left Behind book and the Left Behind series of movies 
that were popular in some years, uh, some years ago. Others engaged revelation more figuratively. They largely embraced the prophecies of the Bible and especially revelation as being more symbolic in nature. There are very smart and spiritual people on all sides of these different views of the book of Revelation. But it seems to me that in the matter of finding meaning out of Revelation, it really just comes down to the Spirit's leading as you're reading and one's own eschatological personality. Eschatology is the study of the end times, the end of the world as we know it. That's what John describes in the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, the end of the world as we know it. And what I've realized is that whether someone reads the Revelation figuratively, whether they read it literally, what I realize is that no matter how you engage the scriptures, no matter how you engage this book, all of the basic understandings of the text, depending on how you read it, point to the same concluding message, that the story is not over. And sometimes, y'all, we get so charged up reading Revelation as if it is the account of how it all will go down once and for all. It's over after this. We miss the opportunity to share the good news that even in the last book of the Bible, it gives the message that the story is not over. That's, a, that's the message that I hear John sharing in the book of Revelation after sending messages to seven churches in modern day Turkey, after seeing the vision of Jesus as the Lamb of God, after seeing the vision of the opening of seven seals, after the vision of the woman, the child, and the dragon, after the vision of the outpouring of divine wrath, we get to the end of the book of Revelation, and just when you expect the final credits to roll and the lead characters to walk off into the sunset and for God to take a bow, God lets John and us know that the story isn't over until God says it's over. Even when you think it is the end, God sends messages along the way to let you know that the story isn't over. I don't know about you, but that's a gospel I need to hear right here and right now. Just look at our text this morning. John the Elder provides an apocalyptic revelation of prophecy that should empower and encourage and inspire every listening ear. We gain spiritual nourishment by the fact that one, this passage is written by someone who is under house arrest, convicted and sentenced to imprisonment on the island of Patmos. In the first chapter, ninth verse, the author of the book of Revelation, John, says he was imprisoned on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. The governing authorities of his time did not want his views to become contagious and get others thinking the same thing, that there was a God who was higher than political power. There was a God who was greater than the empire. The powerful were afraid that John's disease of their belief of a mighty and amazing God would catch on and others would get infected. And so instead of allowing the disease of John to spread all around the land, they sent him into quarantine. They put him in the house, closed the door. He was basically under house arrest. And it's while he's under house arrest that he witnesses this grand vision from God. And there's a witness in here that can testify that over the past 12 months, there were times that when the going got its roughest, that's when you experienced God most powerfully. Somebody can say that it was at the darkness of the night that you saw the hand of God moving. Somebody can say that it was when the hellfires were burning the hottest when you heard God's voice calling the loudest. Somebody knows 
that it was when everyone had deserted you. That's when you saw God moving in your life. It's something about being in trouble that gives you a clear eye and a keen ear to what God is saying and how God is moving. It lets us know that trials and tribulations don't have to cloud your connection with God, but they can enhance your ability to see something new from God. And sure enough, as the old world dies in the book of Revelation, as trouble is all around him, John sees something brand new. John sees a new heaven and a new earth. John sees that when everything is crumbling around him, God decided to push the reset button. Not just on earth, but on heaven too. That's the second good point of good news in this passage. In the midst of persecution, pain, oppression, and trials and tribulation, God decides not to revive the old, but to give birth to something new altogether. God pushes reset. <laughs> you know, Deacon Daniel, it reminds me of playing Nintendo with my brother Anthony when we were growing up. We are a very competitive family. And I remember the many games we would play as boys, and my dad is just as competitive. We all play together, and I remember we were playing games together like uh, the game Excite, uh, Moto, Moto, what's the game? Excite Bite. And then there's the game with the gun, the, uh, the ducks. Duck Hunt. Man, I remember, especially with Duck Hunt, we would put the gun to the screen. <laughs> <laughs> because we wanted to get an advantage. We were just that competitive in our house. But I remember uh, that as we were playing and one would get the best of the other, we, we, weren't, uh, <laughs> we, we weren't modest enough, we weren't humble enough uh, just to win politely. But when we were beating the other, or if I was getting beat, it was not uncommon in our home for... <laughs> us to start bragging as we're beating the person. Uh, so as we're playing the games and you're beating them, you got to show them, you got to show them that you really are on top and we would start talking trash to each other. Well, sometimes it would get so heavy, it gets so hot, it gets so heated, that in a fit of anger, we would get so angry that somebody who was getting beat up on would take their finger and there was a little button on the Nintendo console in red letters. Reset. And somebody would rush and push the reset button to start the game on over. Now, at that point, uh, we start fighting or something, because at that point, it's like, no, man, you messed up my game. But when I think about that reset button, I think about Revelation. Everything was crumbling around, and the enemy was putting its boot on the neck of John, and goodness seemed nowhere to be found. Wickedness was everywhere. And God says, nah, 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 we're going to push. <laughs> Reset. God resets the reality. God decides not to revive the old, but to give birth to something altogether new. And somebody watching right now should be thankful that some things didn't come with you, even through a year like this. There are some things, there are some parts, there are some features and components, some facets of our lives that fell away. And as God pushes reset in your life, we can look back now with a certain degree of appreciation that those things fell away from us. That no, all is not well, yes. There are still troubles in front of us, yes. There are still things to do. But when I examine who I was just eight months ago and compare it to who I am now, there are aspects of who I was that I'm glad is not with me right now. Good God have mercy. There's some honest people watching me right now who can say this has not been the easiest year, but there are some bright spots in the journey. There is some silver lining in the story that there were some aspects of who I was. And only when I got some distance away from that person could I look back and see and say, man, that brother was really struggling. Sometimes we don't know how bad we got it. 
Sometimes we don't know how deep we are in the mud of a challenge until we get some distance away from it, look back on it and say, my God in heaven, I'm so glad that God delivered me from something that I did not even think was a threat. God pushed reset. God pushed reset and allowed some things to pass right on away. I'm encouraged by that, but not only am I encouraged by the resetting of individual realities, but I'm excited by how God is resetting Christian communities all over the land as well. I'm excited by how God is resetting what it means to be church. After bearing the brunt of more than a year of social, economic, political, and international hardship, God is resetting the minds of believers and resetting the church as well. Consider this, will you? Common security clubs are popping up everywhere as people are recognizing that in times like these, we got to come together in order to make it. People are helping one another in mutual aid societies. They're starting susus and putting money in the pot and helping to pay one another out of debt. People are coming together to establish homeschool co-ops and networks. They're figuring out and finding out ways to get it done. This is a time that is bringing us together in ways that other times perhaps did not allow. But here in this moment, we are seeing that there's strength in coming together. We're also seeing in our churches the sophistication and evolution of our understanding of what, what it means to be church. Where church was at one point just about getting dressed up and coming to a building. It was about, yes, fellowship and singing and prayer and preaching. Now we're at a place where the building and the significance of the building is decreasing. And what's increasing is each individual home developing and nurturing and cultivating spiritual base and practices where the pastor ain't even there. Good God have mercy. Where there was a time where what pastor said was really what it was that was the North Star for so many people. Now you got to have your own connection. Now you got to do your own work. Now you got to lean in more and strain your own ear to hear the voice of Almighty God. And can I say, that's a good thing. That's a wonderful maturing development in the body of Christ that now we can finally, especially us Baptists up in here, now we can finally get to a place where we truly salute the scripture that points to the priesthood of all believers. That yes, we recognize the giftedness of pastors, but in days like these, pastors not available all the time. In days like these, the weight is heavy on your shoulder in your house with your family and your friends. And now we are pushed to develop our own spiritual muscles. Now we are developed, now pushed rather, to get to a place where we can say, it's me. It's me, it's me, oh Lord, and I'm standing in the need of prayer. The song says, not my mother, not my father, but it's me, oh Lord. Not the pastor, not the deacon, but it's me, oh Lord. This time is calling us to an important reset where now everybody got to flex their spiritual muscles a bit more. We all have to lean in a little bit better. We have to support one another. Whether you have a title in front of your name or letters behind your name, we are at a place where every hand that's ready to help is welcomed and every heart that is softened to support is embraced. I'm remembering Galatians chapter 6 verse 2 which says, Bear one another's burdens and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. I'll let you go by reminding you, John got a vision from God in the middle of despair on house arrest, in quarantine. That's when John heard God's voice. John saw something new when the old was no longer sustainable. But not only that, I bid you good morning by telling you 
that there is something unbelievable about this new heaven and new earth. The Bible says in verse 3 that John heard a voice as the new heaven and the new earth was coming down. And the voice said, now the home of God is among women and men. In other words, the scripture is saying that God is no longer far off and away in Never Never Land, but that God has decided to bring you something and to live with you in the midst of the new something. Guess who moved into the neighborhood? God says no more separation, no more division, no more distance between me and you. God says the story is not over because I've decided to take up residence with you. God says, I'm going to stretch your understanding about what heaven is. You used to think heaven was a place you go to after you die. But John bears witness under house arrest, in quarantine, in stressful and struggling times. John bears witness that you ain't got to wait for heaven. John bears witness that heaven can come to you. Good God have mercy. And when the new heaven gets here, heaven as it comes will be filled with the chief occupant. God says, I'm going to be with you in your new heaven and with you in your new earth. You ain't got to wait till Sunday. You don't have to wait till an appointed time. You don't have to wait until the live stream comes. God says, I'm here with you right now. I'm available to you. I'm accessible to you. You can call me. You can reach for me. And I'll be right there with you no matter the day, no matter the hour, no matter the time, no matter the situation. God says, enough already. Enough with the reality that keeps, di keeps you distant from me. Enough with the reality that keeps you separated from my power and my presence. God says, I'm going to come to your living room. Good God, have mercy. And while so many people were waiting to get to the sanctuary room before all of this, God says, I'm going to flip the whole script. Now your living room is the sanctuary. Now your kitchen is the sanctuary. Now your front porch is the sanctuary and I'm going to meet you right where you are. Look at this. John got the benefit of seeing God on the way. John got the benefit of seeing heaven come in his direction. And I just would encourage somebody today that even as you are under house arrest, you might feel like the walls are closing in. Even as some of you are in a quarantine situation, can I tell you there is nothing that can separate you from the love and the power of God. There is nothing that can keep you from the attention and the affection of the Almighty. There is no disease that can distance you from the almighty loving hand of God. I'm here just to encourage you today that God is on the way. That's what John would say. John said, I saw God on the way. And watch this. John said, I didn't wait till God got all the way to me. I didn't wait until heaven landed in my midst. I didn't wait till earth bubbled up in my experience. John said, I decided to write about it even before it got to me. John said, I saw it coming. And I just would encourage somebody today that you too can stand in the joy of celebrating the fact that God is on the way. Good God have mercy. I'm going to shout all by myself that God is on the way. That is enough for us to celebrate and that is enough for us to appreciate that God is on the way. That God is not just coming. That God is not just here. But God is present with us even now. Reverend Candace Simpson, not too long ago, preached a powerful message here with the Pleasant Hope family, where she reminded us about Emmanuel, God with us. John said, that's more than a phrase for me. John says in Revelation, I got some clarity. I got some clarity over what this reality that I'm living in really is doing. 
what it's really doing is helping to give me a better sight line to God on the way. I, I see heaven better now. I see a new earth better now because I'm in a situation where so many of the things that kept me bound are crumbling around my feet. Hmm. Nine months into this situation, nine months into this year rather, we're at a place today where people have a sharper understanding of what priorities are. Maybe last year this time it would have been different. But nine months into this year and many months into this situation that we are in together, multiple pandemics from health to anti-blackness and violence, state-sanctioned violence, now we have a keener sense of what a priority is. Maybe that's what John experienced. John was busy going to this church, that church, all around Asia Minor or modern day Turkey. But when he got still, when he got some solitude and some distance away from the crowd and the people, he saw God in a way he'd never seen God before. And God said, I can't do this no more. I can't watch you from a distance going through all that you're going through. I'm going to come and live with you. I'm, I'm going to reset your heaven and your earth because maybe some of your thoughts about earth are wrong, but also some of your thoughts about heaven is wrong too. Heaven ain't something you got to work, wait for. Heaven is on the way now. God says, I want to be with you. I want to stand with you. I want to live with you every day. Your living room is my living room. Your bedroom, my bedroom. <laughs> your yard is my yard. I'm with you. And for somebody watching me right now who maybe feels isolated, alienated, all by yourself, trying to pick up the world, put it on your shoulders, push through. I hear God saying, take a chill pill because you tried all that other stuff before. L let me just, let me help you. I ain't going to meet you halfway. I'm going to come all the way. Because you're in a situation where you don't have energy to push through anymore. Exhaustion is running rampant in the world right now. And the kind of exhaustion that a quick nap can't fix. <laughs> you ever take a nap or go to sleep and still wake up tired? <laughs> oh, man. That's real. <laughs> God says, you in a situation where I can't even wait for you to push through no more. You tried that. Let me just meet you right where you are. I'll come to you. Heaven and earth is on the way. New heaven, new earth, new reality. Reset. And here's the great thing about it. The story is not over. It may feel like it sometimes, but it's not over. New chapters are being written. New events are unfolding. And God is still on the way. Oh, my goodness. Here's the paradox of God. God is here. And God is on the way. <laughs> Listen, this is mind blowing. God is here, Emmanuel with us. God is with us, Emmanuel. God is with us. And John says, not only is God with us, but also God is on the way. How does that make sense? I don't know. <laughs> but I'm comforted by the fact that we serve the kind of God, that we're in relationship with the kind of God who don't need it to be Sunday, who don't need you to be in church, who don't need you to dress up and get all together and do the things. God said, you, you need 
you need bedside service today. <laughs> you, you need a door-to-door -door delivery from glory today. And if you're here, you're with me, you're watching right now, and that's you, if you need bedside service, you need door-to-door -door delivery, God said, I am on the way. Say no more. I'm with you and I'm coming to you at the same time. With that in mind, can I pray with you? Can I pray with you? Let's pray. Gracious God, we love you and we thank you today. We thank you, Lord, for being the kind of God who loves us enough to extend your mercy when it's hard for us to find our footing. We thank you today for mercy. That's what I see in Revelation chapter 21. Mercy. As John was banned to an island to die alone, the intent of the power structure was for John to die alone. But because of your mercy, you showed up for John. And he didn't just live, but he experienced life more abundantly. God, many of us are suffering under similar dynamics where the forces of this world and the factors of our lives are pushing us to a place of deep and grave alienation and isolation. Pushing us to the point where we'll fall to our knees and potentially die alone. But for the believer, you let us know there is no such thing as dying alone. There is no such thing as living alone. You walk with us. You talk with us. You tell us that we are your own. And for the person, God, who feels that they are by themselves, I pray in the name of Jesus that you encourage them right now. Send angels to remind them that even in this moment, they are not by themselves. Thank you for your presence, for your love, for your grace, and for your mercy. Thank you for telling us that the story's not over. Yes, it's hard, but the story ain't over. Yes, I'm tired, but the story isn't over. I'm frustrated, but it ain't over. New chapters are being written. This is not the end, it's an end. An end to the old earth, an end to the old heaven, but we don't have to despair. New heaven, new earth, and the best neighbor, the, the best roommate one could ever have. God, you said, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to live with you. And we thank you for that. In the strong and mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Amen. Go ahead and tweet, text, post, tell somebody. Story ain't over. I know it's bad English, but it's good gospel. The story ain't over. Let that marinate in your spirit and share that with a sister or brother. And as you do, can I invite you to connect with our ministry and our church? There are many ways to connect with Pleasant Hope Baptist Church. You may want to connect with us by way of formal membership. You want to become a member of this church. You need a pastor in your life and you sense and feel that I would make a good pastor for you. Well, I agree. <laughs> Come on in, join the church. I would love to be your pastor. I would love to share and do life with you and your loved ones. But perhaps you already got a church home or maybe 
That's not what you're looking for. No worries, there's other ways to connect. You can connect with this ministry by linking with our Freedom School. It's called Orita's Cross Freedom School. It's where we serve and support young people in this community to help build up their racial self-esteem and help them to celebrate who God made them to be. It's a place where we reimagine what education can look like and instead of a banking method of education. Paulo Ferrar talks about a problem posing education, the pedagogy of the oppressed, and we create space for that kind of imaginative and courageous learning. You can connect with our church through Aretha's Cross Freedom School. Or maybe food is your thing and food justice is what's calling you. Come on in. Our church has a garden, Maxine's Garden. For the past decade, we've been growing food on a piece of the front yard of our physical building. We'd love to connect with you by way of the church garden. Or if you got a wider view, a food systems view, you can connect with the Black Church Food Security Network that was birthed and born right here in the bosom of the Pleasant Hope Baptist Church as well. Yeah, we are an average sized church, a hundred and some members, but we serve a mega God who calls us to an amazing gospel and ministry and we just believe that we might as well go for it. That we might pursue everything God has placed within us. And if you think there's a lane where you can connect, Freedom School, Garden, Food Network, Dance Ministry, Multimedia Ministry, you saw the light flickering on one of my lights when I, when I was preaching. Y'all saw that? You can come on and join the multimedia ministry. No matter what zip code you're in, you can assist and support with our social media outreach or all the other things that go along with even doing this right now. All I'm saying is there's room for you too. Just send me an email, pastor at pleasanthope.org, pastor at pleasanthope.org. We'll connect you get you all squared away, and we'll start to walk together in faith. Even as you consider that, allow me to have a final prayer and benediction as we prepare to close out this service. I pray you have an amazing week. There's a lot on all of our plates. We're juggling all kinds of things right now. Be encouraged today to know that a new heaven and a new earth is on the way. Reset is coming. God says, I'm with you. The story's not over. We'll keep on pushing forward. Let me rephrase that, not pushing forward. We'll keep on expecting, waiting, looking, and accepting and embracing that which is already here by the presence of God. With that, let's pray. Gracious God, we love you and we thank you today for the wonderful worship experience and we pray God that as reset is happening all around us, that you help us to see it not as the end, but an end, not as the beginning, but a beginning. Help us to have a more expansive view of your beginnings and your endings, trusting that as you begin things and as you end things and as you reset, that you are about a great work in us. Even if we don't fully understand it, we look forward to revelation, clarity, sprouting in our experience. Until that time, we have the faith to believe that you're on the way and you're here. New heaven, new earth, powerful new roommate, God is with us. Let that be our refrain and the words of our celebration. Now may the love of God and the sweet communion of God's Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide with each of us. Henceforth, now, and forevermore, May we all say amen and amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. See you next time.